We'll move on to our uh, first panel on politics and immigration and Dr. Anastasia Mann of the uh, Immigration Democracy Center here at Eagleton Institute will be the moderator. And all the panelists, I guess if you can just come on up and about 17 minutes for a panel with five very esteemed guests, each with a really important perspective to share. This is going to be a, a turbo panel. And regrettable in some respects, sometimes I think these things work best because they make everybody just cut to the point and say exactly what they have to say. Uh, my name is Anastasia Mann, and I direct the program on immigration and democracy, which is uh, located within the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Um, we're a think and do tank. We, um, Eagleton is an institute of applied politics, and the work that we've done is research oriented, but also um, has a, a big service and, and um, a component that is about doing work in communities, principally at this moment about uh, offering application assistance to immigrants uh, throughout New Jersey from all over the world. Um, and there are flyers about it out in the in the hall. We have a, a citizenship drive happening this Saturday in Newark and two weeks from now in um, New Brunswick at the Student Center. Um, th what's exciting especially about this panel is that we have um, local leaders or leaders who are the head of community community-based organizations but networks of community-based organizations. Um, the two principal uh, organizations working throughout New Jersey to organize Latinos around political issues and to galvanize um, and kind of leverage Latino political power. Um, we also have um, somebody from a regional organization that can maybe shed light on how New Jersey compares to our neighboring states and what the challenges are of um, bringing uh, communities within different states together. And then we have a federal perspective too, as well as a perspective from the state legislature. So it's super exciting. I've decided in the interest of time and kind of relevance that it would make most sense to have each of you just give us a minute on kind of who you are and what you do. And then maybe on three minutes, because that's about what we have, two to three minutes, and I will be a, a tough um, enforcer of time on what you see as the challenges for Latino political organizing, um, or if you want to reject the idea of Latino political organizing, by all means do that, but um, in the next decade. So would you go first, say your name, say what you, what sure. you do and what, you're, what you see the challenges as. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, my name is Gabriela Mosquera. I am Assemblywoman of the 4th Legislative District that's uh, representing Camden County and Gloucester County. I actually am um, an immigrant to this nation. I came to this country when I was three years old. I am the first person in my family to um, have a college degree and also have an advanced, uh, uh, a, like a graduate degree. I have a, my MBA. I became a citizen at the age of 18, so I am proud to say that I am living my American dream. I am the second Latina of Camden County to be elected into office. I am the first Ecuadorian to represent uh, this uh, to be uh, of Ecuadorian descent to represent a, a state to be in the state legislature, so I am very happy to to be here. Um, what's the next thing? Well, tell us just some of the uh, briefly the issues that you have confronted and that um, being in the state legislature and how you feel what what have been challenges for you in representing um, your community in the state legislature. Actually, um, I have a kind of like a different perspective. I have been very honored to represent uh, Latinos in the state. Um, I started out as a, an intern in the state legislature. I was a political science major in college and I was very lucky to get a, a 
an internship in the uh, Assembly Democratic Office, which is in Trenton, which is the uh, partisan office in the State House. So I was able to learn about state politics, learn about state government. I always wanted to be part of the government process ever since I was a kid. I just didn't know how that was going to happen. So I was very fortunate enough to, to get a coveted spot. And because of that, I was able to meet a lot of people and learn about uh, the, the issues in the state. And I was very <laughs> proud as a Latina to be part of the, the, the process and represent my community and help my community out in, in any way I can. Great, thank you so much. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Bill Ayala. I'm with the Latino Leadership Alliance. Um, I'm an attorney and I've been with the Alliance since its inception in um, 1998. And currently for the Latino Leadership Alliance, I'm working on a project called the Latino Health Institute. Uh, the Latino Health Institute is an initiative that's funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, what we're trying to do is to set up a permanent um, mobilizing effort around the issue of Latino health and eliminating health disparities in our community, um, specifically in New Jersey. Um, some of the biggest challenges uh, since I've been working on this project um, is that when you reach out to different parts of the community in New Jersey, um, you know, Robert did a great job of talking about the big six in northern New Jersey, but even when you talk about a condensed um, population like we have in some parts of the state, you also have um, different pockets of Latino um, communities throughout the state that are kind of disconnected from each other. And you have a lot of um, people who you know, are <clears throat> mobilizing to do things to try and help our community, but I don't think we as a community have a good idea or a good um, image of who we are in this state and the contributions that we make. And that's why I, when I listen to um, presentations like what Robert did with the Latino Information Network and the Pew Hispanic Center, which I think is um, an invaluable resource, it really helps change the, the idea of who we are, that we make contributions um, to this state and to this country. And we are not a drain on the resources of this country. We're helping to build it economically and culturally. So what we're do how does that relate to our project and what we're trying to do as far as healthcare? Um, healthcare is probably the most um, um, it, the most important issue front and center nationally when you're talking about national politics in the upcoming presidential election. And we know that this issue is coming before the Supreme Court um, where the recent health care reform is being challenged and we're going to see um, coming up, you know, what the health care system is going to look like for the, for the foreseeable future with the Supreme Court decision which is due in, um, which is due in June. And we are trying to organize um, Latinos to try and address the, the health issue in trying to eliminate disparities in our community. One thing that Robert pointed out was that access to health care, health care insurance is a critical issue for us. We're, nearly one third of us don't have access to health care insurance. But compare that to other populations and then you get a clearer picture of what a health disparity is. When you're talking about the white population, it's about 14% that don't have access to health care insurance. So when you talk about our community, we're two times more likely to have um, no health insurance than the white population. And our effort is an effort to try and bridge that gap and to eliminate those disparities statewide and try and develop um, policies that would help do that on the state and national level. Thanks, that's great. Ms. Sanchez. Hi, my name is Bruni Sanchez. I'm a data dissemination specialist for the Census Bureau's New York Regional Office. I'm bilingual, speak Spanish, so. Uh, what I do is, um, all the data that was presented here by our um, remarkable two keynote speakers, I do presentations such as this in different forums, and I also conduct workshops where I teach either um, educators or community-based organizations, the government, um, nonprofit organizations, how to access the census data and how to interpret the data. So, and I am so relieved today that I didn't have to do no data because when I heard the two people that were the keynote speakers, I knew they would take care of all that. So, uh, what I would like to say is my concerns um, with the federal government and the U.S. Census Bureau 
is that um, we all agree that the data that was presented today, you know, and that is available by us, is very valuable in terms of measuring the New Jersey Hispanics and Hispanics at a national level. Um, we saw how the figures compared um, the Hispanics from 2000 to th 2010. We saw the increase in areas such as Alabama. Yes, I have a sister who lives in Alabama, <laughs> so there are Latinos there. And then um, we saw the projections for 2050. You know, those are, these are all based from the Census Bureau's either estimates program or the decennial information. So I wanted to tell you a little bit today about what the Census Bureau does the other nine years, because we do conduct a census every 10 years, but what do we do the other nine years? Well, we conduct surveys. So we conduct surveys. Most of the uh, data that was obtained today was from the American Community Survey. Also, Mark's presentation mentioned the Current Population Survey. That's where we get the unemployment rates that's published by the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's the Survey of Income and Program Participation. These are all surveys that the Census Bureau conducts on an annual basis. So every year, we go out and we sample a large number of respondents throughout the nation, right? This is how we measure our nation's economic you know, growth, our progress in terms of social, economic, and housing characteristics. So, um, however, every year as you know, we progress, we are facing enormous challenges with obtaining this data. So I was so excited and thrilled to be asked to be a part of this because now as um, persons that are concerned about the Has Hispanic and Latino issues in New Jersey, I can use you to be our ambassadors and spread the word that the surveys that we conduct are to, just to provide statistics so that when groups such as yours and forums get together, you can establish what, how to move forward with pub public policy issues. So it is fundamental that you help us spread the word, you know, about the importance of our surveys and our censuses, and, you know, speak to your constituents. And regarding 2020, you know, let's keep this com these lines of communication open with the federal government so that when 2020 census comes up, we will mobilize everyone and we will get an accurate count of Latinos in New Jersey and in the nation. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lucia Gomez Jimenez. I am the executive director of a nonprofit called La Fuente. We're based out of um, New York City. Uh, we're called the Tri State Worker and Community Fund. We're a labor and community collaborative. It's uh, an initiative where we have base building. We empower immigrants, workers, and their neighborhoods um, to participate civically. Um, so, electoral politics, issue oriented campaigns, um, as well as leadership development and grassroots organizing. Um, the organization has been around, it's our 10th anniversary this year. I've been around with the organization since last August. I live in Union City, New Jersey. I am raised in Union City, born in Brooklyn. Um, most of my politics has been in the Northeast, um, specifically New York City and New Jersey. Um, more recently, uh, I usually take a hiatus um, from where I live. There, I have a little theme that I don't do certain things where I live. Uh, I go across um, to the other side, to New York City, to kind of do those things. Um, and when it comes to politics, um, I haven't quite um, stayed to those rules. Um, in, New York, in New Jersey last year, I was involved, I was uh, one of the only Latina staffers, one of the only three, I was one of three women, uh, one of two Latinas, and I was the only staffer, um, woman and Latina, who was staffing the Democratic um, Commission for the redistricting process in the state of New Jersey. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. Um, everybody that was on the commission uh, was elected except for one, which was Assemblywoman um, Nisa Cruz Perez from Camden County. Um, she was an ex-Assemblywoman uh, when she was on the commission, and everybody else was either in leadership uh, Democratic Commission had a great opportunity to see what they thought of Latinos and um, I will tell you what I believe are the challenges um, moving forward within now and the next 10 years. Obviously one I think is the reality that in New Jersey unlike in other states and I would say like, unlike New York there isn't a common culture of base building of community grassroots organizing 
And in New York, where, you know, um, it's very different, and to think in terms of geographic realities, New York City is very concentrated, very dense uh, in terms of the majority of the Latino population being concentrated in a very small, um, concentrated uh, mile area. Whereas New Jersey, the Latino community is spread out, and we saw um, where those realities are when you have to create 40 legislative districts and try to um, unify communities and keep them in, in specific um, senatorial districts or legislative districts in order to maximize their ability to have an amplified voice at the state legislative level. In New York City, there's 150 assembly districts, and there's 62 going to 63 Senate districts, each individually broken up and designated so that they can elect their candidates. There is not a slating process the way there is in the state of New Jersey. So when you talk about, you can't compare apples to oranges in terms of the ability to elect in the state of New Jersey. Um, Gabriela Mosquera is, is an anomaly, um, the way in which other states um, have to elect Latinos or are uh, poised to elect Latinos uh, based on majority districts where you have to have a majority of a population in order to be able to elect in those districts. In the state of New Jersey, the Democratic Party points at you and you have the possibilities to get elected. Doesn't mean that that's a sure thing, but that it is one of the main factors, one of the main criteria. Or the same thing with the Republican Party. Depending on how competitive your district is, that, is, that determines whether or not there's a real election that takes place and whether it's at the primary level or it's at the general level. Very rarely do we have real primary races in the state of New Jersey unlike other states. So the opportunity to be able to elect people, particularly Latinos in areas that are not majority Latino, are really uh, uh, a finger pointing sometimes ability by the parties and their desires to be able to make that happen. Um, so we have to assume some of those realities and some of those some of those rules that come with playing with the different parties. I think the challenges obviously are moving beyond partisan driven um, expectations of our empowerment and being able to empower ourselves regardless of um, the party control. Ironically enough, being right next to New York where we're fighting right now um, trying to pass the New York State Dream Act and we have a Democratic governor a uh, Republican-controlled Senate and a democratically-controlled legislature, uh, you would think that it would be common sense in this. It, it, we always say that if we had a Senate uh, that was in the Democrats, it was easy. You know, one, two, three, Assembly, Senate, Democrat. It would have happened. But in New Jersey, where you have Assembly and Dem and Senate, you can't get that past the Assembly and the Senate right now. I mean, let alone to get it to the governor. So I think it's very interesting to see where we either, we're gonna have a major challenge in configuring what is a policy agenda. I think um, for Latinos or for immigrant communities across the state, it's going to be uh, a challenge. I think there are certain things that we should start off with in terms of um, concrete winnables and things that we can actually um, get past both in the Assembly and the Senate and force more progressive type of legislation that they will be forced to then say, well, if you're down with Latinos and you're down with the immigrant communities and pass you know, these kinds of legislation, on, other than having to fight things like E-Verify from some of the leadership trying to push it and get it jammed in through, um, easily will be signed by someone like you know, a Republican governor, but at the same time, sad that we would have to fight against uh, a democratically controlled Senate and, and Assembly. So I think moving beyond the partisan uh, politics and forcing those uh, legislators to take real stances uh, and forcing them to make the difficult decisions for their constituencies that don't have majority um, you know, immigrant or majority Latino populations is going to be a major challenge. Because at the end of the day, they know who their constituents are. They know who their voters are. And um, if you don't know, because you know, uh, you know, there's tons of um, that voter data sold, there's tons of organizations that have it free and tons of ways that even though this, the um, voter registration form doesn't ask for your race and ethnicity, there's a way scientifically, obviously, and using technology, it's a lot easier and a lot um, nittier to get down to the, to the very local level to understand who your electorate is. The elected officials understand who their electorate is. They know who to buy favor with. They know what they need to push. And unless we're able to mobilize on the grassroots level and give an, an, an image, of more ability to empower ourselves and mobilize um, at the state level and even at the local levels, then we're not gonna get beyond the cheap kind of uh, policies that we have right now that are not very progressive for immigrant communities, or at least we haven't seen the kind of positive immigrant um, type of legislation that we would expect from a state neighboring um, areas like New York uh, Thanks, and Connecticut. Lucy.
That's great. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Christian Estevez. I'm the uh, Executive Vice President of the Latino Action Network, and I'm also an organizer for the Communication Workers of America. I'm glad to be back here at Rutgers. Uh, this is where I did uh, my undergrad and grad work. Um, I was uh, where I majored in Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies and labor relations. Um, and I, you know, um, spent several years also teaching as an adjunct in the uh, School of Management and Labor Relations, where the course I, I focused on was um, Latino workers in the United States. So, uh, you know, these topics that we're talking about today are very close to my heart uh, in so many ways. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, besides uh, that, I was also when I was here at Rutgers. Um, a, a student leader. Um, the, the year before, Lucia was co-chair of the Latino Student Council. I was. Um, and we brought together the 22 Latino student organizations here on, on this uh, New Brunswick campus, uh, you know, in order to kind of um, bring together that, that Latino power on campus, uh, you know, through uh, cross-organizational. Um, after college, I continued my organizing uh, locally and also statewide, working with Lucia and Bill Ayala and some others, uh, where we formed the Latino Leadership Alliance, and I served for uh, six years as the vice president of that organization. And my role as the vice president, I did a lot of traveling the state, par partially because I was one of the youngest ones there, so um, had probably uh, the ability to run around the state, um, meeting a lot of people, um, and doing a lot of grassroots organizing. And in uh, late 2009, uh, I worked together with a lot of folks uh, throughout the state to form the Latino Action Network, which now I'm the vice president of. Um, and, you know, looking at what we're talking about today, um, you know, and the question that was kind of posed to us in terms of uh, what is the, uh, the, the big issue for Latinos, um, I, I struggled with that question because, you know, uh, and I get in trouble for saying this, that it's not so much that Latinos have our own issues, it's how the issues impact our community. Right, and I think the statistics were great. I don't have to go into that because they did such a great job with that. But you see it, right? We're thinking about the same things the rest of America is thinking about: jobs, education, healthcare, right? And even though immigration was down at the bottom of the list, it still factors in. And I'll tell you that um, I was also honored to be part of the governor's blue ribbon panel on immigrant affairs uh, back in uh, 2008, 2009. And we spent over a year, you know, talking to people all over the state. Uh, compiling information about how the state uh, uh, doesn't serve Latinos very well, uh, what are the disparities, and, and, and then recommendations on how to close those gaps. And it basically crossed the entire spectrum of issues. It was healthcare, it was jobs, it was education, it was job training, it was access to local government, right? It was language. Um, you know, you name it, it, we were everywhere. And, you know, the, the focus of the Latino Action Network is to bring Latinos together throughout the state, work with groups all over in established enclaves, uh, like the big six, right, the big cities where Latinos have been around for a long time, have developed a political, uh, a political identity, um, even to the point where now uh, Latinos are running against, against each other. Some people say it's a bad thing, I say it's a good thing. I think it's great to have several Latinos uh, running because now you're not just gonna vote for the only Latino in the race, you're gonna get to choose between which one has the best ideas, which one brings the best energy, you know, and the community gets to choose. That's a wonderful thing. But also, the land has been doing a lot of work in what we call emerging communities, in places like in Hunterdon County, Fle you know, Flemington, um, we're talking about um, Monmouth County and uh, Freehold. We talk about uh, you know, the, the growing community in uh, Morris County, Dover, and all these type of places where they're all at different levels of, of organizing and civic engagement, and they're not necessarily getting the attention of the big organizations uh, and, and, the, and the money. Uh, I've worked on several uh, statewide campaigns, and these are the places that the campaigns ignore because they're not, they're, they don't bring enough uh, you know, there's not enough oomph there, right? You're not going to get a big bang for your buck, but so they get ignored by the political apparatus. Um, luckily, we now have, uh, you know, our organization that, that works with them, doesn't try to take them over, doesn't try to tell them what to do, but rather says, look, you can tap into this network, we'll tie you in with other people who have been through what you've been through, um, are doing the same type of thing or have done it, and, you know, and we can help you out also. 
um, you can be part of the conversation in shaping our policy agenda. And so when we come out with uh, you know, uh, policy positions or we go down and testify uh, in the legislature on a particular issue, when we participated in the process for redistricting, uh, we were able to get people who, a lot of names, nobody had ever heard of. But they represented communities that needed to be heard. Because when you drew these maps, you needed to keep, you know, one of the criteria was communities of interest. And if you just looked at it, numbers and maps, right? you would draw maps completely different. But if you understood the communities, you understood how they interacted, you had to draw it a certain way because that's how people actually came you know, uh, into contact with each other. And some of the proposals that were running around out there were absurd in terms of how disconnected they were because someone just looked at a map and did a circle and said, you know, they're within a certain proximity to each other. Well, you know what? You know, those communities don't even interact at all. Matter of fact, you'd have to draw, drive through several towns in a big circle to get to the other place. Um, so they don't share the same hospital. They don't go to the same, they don't shop in the same areas, right? So these are the type of things that, you know, we've been trying to do. And really to get in, into all the issues. And, you know, some people say, well, why are you talking about that? That's not a Latino issue. And, and we always take the position of everything's a Latino issue. Okay, we have a stake in everything. Um, recently, you know, I got some phone calls because Latino Action Network um, took a stand in support of marriage equality. And some people said, oh, you should have done that, you know, that's not a Latino issue. And we said, wait a second. You know, and they said, well, you know, why are you doing that for the gay community? And, and I said, my answer always was, are you telling me that you don't think there's any gay Latinos who may want to get married? You know, um, so, it's, it was, uh, you know, it's one of these type of things that we have to look at every single issue, um, look at it from the lens of our community, and speak up on, on it. And not to say that our position, the Latino Action Network's position, is everybody, every Latino's position. You know, we differ. I know that there are, I know a lot of Latinos who took the opposite position than the land took on marriage equality. I know a lot of Latinos who think maybe differently than we do about the Affordable Care Act, uh, Health Care Act, right? Um, but it's okay, we need to have our voices out there. You know, we have to stop letting people put us in a box and say, all Latinos think this. We know for a fact from the stats that we just saw that we don't all think exactly alike, that we do all come from different um, perspectives. And so what we do with Latino Action Network is we speak up, you know, uh, from, from one point of view. And sometimes it's different too. We have our fights internally before we come out with that, right? Um, and, and it's knock out, drag out, you know, fights about what is, what we're going to come out with the, at the end. But at the end of the day, you know, there's, we have to be out there speaking about it. We're not mad when somebody else comes out and says the opposite thing, because that's the nature of our community. And so we need to keep the conversation going. I thank the Hall Institute for doing this, uh, because this is the type of thing, the type of forums that we need more of. Thank you. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, it, the phenomenon that you point to, the increasing suburbanization of immigrant communities and Latinos um, in particular is really, uh, uh, couldn't be more relevant. Um, I mean, it's true of the country in general, but it's particularly true of New Jersey, which is um, a suburban state in particular. Um, and so as a challenge for political organizing, that's a real, um, uh, factor that that all of us are grappling with so it's useful to get your perspective on I'm going to pose one more question before opening it to the floor and that is um, the last few years in New Jersey have been particularly bad I would say for um, immigrants uh, low-income immigrants in general and uh, low-income Latinos in particular um, and just to point to two policy issues in which, um, which have, which sort of manifest this um, difficulty. Uh, there has been the In-State Tuition Act, which the, came to the state legislature in 2010, and then also um, just a purely administrative move that um, Governor Christie uh, instituted shortly after coming to office, which was to change the way New Jersey carries out its um, health uh, insurance for low-income families. And the, the policy change was to revert to the federal standard um, of eligibility, which had the effect of removing 12,000 legal permanent residents. So these are legal immigrants who qualify for citizenship in many cases um, off of 
um, the roles, say eligibility, out of eligibility, including some people with chronic cases, some of whom got, um, were picked up in other ways. But that's a, that's a, that's, those were two big setbacks, I think, if, if you have a pro immigrant or a pro-Latino agenda. And I guess I'm wondering, given the kind of political realities that Lucia talked about and the um, ideological differences that may separate and uh, distinguish some of the organizations from each other, what, what's, how are we moving forward here? Um, and I guess, Bill, I would direct that to you okay. first because of your focus on healthcare and your involvement with Latino Leadership Alliance, if you Sure. Um, well, first, let, just touching on the immigration aspect, the, the growth in our community um, nationwide and also here in New Jersey is really um, has the potential to dramatically change the power structure, the political power structure of, of this country and also of this state. And I just want to give a quick example. Like, we're, we're in a presidential election right now. And let's talk about a state like Florida. Uh, it used to be that Florida, the Hispanic population, was majority Republican. The growth in the Hispanic population in Florida has shifted that to now where there are 100,000 more Hispanic Democrats in Florida than there are Hispanic Republicans. That's a monumental shift when you're talking about electing a president. Because now Florida is a state that's a toss-up state. Republicans can't win a general election without Florida. And now they're forced to defend pretty much their home turf. There are a lot of Floridas all over the country, different sizes, whether you're talking about counties, cities, whether you're talking about different regions. And the, the one problem, and I think Lucia um, has talked about this, very eloquently is that there is a gap, um, and Robert talked about it, in um, political capital. When you take a look at eligible Latino voters, um, people who are eligible to vote, and uh, I, by that I mean people who are registered and not registered. You have people who are not registered who could register to vote. There's a gap between that number and likely voters. And that gap is all the political power we're leaving on the table and that we're not utilizing. And when it comes to things like in-state in tuition, um, you know, that, the, that was a subcomponent that was supposed to be addressed by the Federal DREAM Act, which was derailed in Congress specifically in the, in the United States Senate. They weren't able to vote on the DREAM Act um, because they weren't able to get cloture. To get cloture means you have to get 60 votes, 60 out of 100 senators to end debate and then to vote on it. We fell short the last time we got 55. I'm just going to interject for one second to say that even when, if and when the DREAM Act passes at the federal level, states are still going to need to enact their own yeah. um, legislation there, there to, been different, to make uh, There have been in different versions of the DREAM Act over mm -hmm. the last few years where it would mandate um, in-state tuition and then that provision has been taken out to try and to get it through. There have been, and this ever since it was first introduced by Senator, um, um, actually Orrin Hatch was one of the um, original sponsors and Durbin. Um, but when you take a look at the in-state tuition, and then you talk about changing the health care, which the Affordable Care Act, what's going to happen in the Supreme Court is going to have such a dramatic impact on the way health care is developed. You take those two issues and you make it tougher for us to go to school, you make it tougher for us to um, get adequate health care, you're further marginalizing us in society. And you have the upward pressure of the growth of population, and then you're having this pushback by the established power structure to marginalize our community um, politically um, uh, uh, on whatever level, whether it's local government, state government, or national, I think that's the part that's, that, that's um, providing the conflict right now. And one, we had a, a healthcare conference at the Blaustein School in October. And I think um, when we're talking about health, Senator Menendez gave a presentation. At the end of his presentation, he really summed it up very well when he says that we as Latinos really have to, you know, whether we have the ability to elect our own representatives like we did in the fourth, or whether we have the ability to exert pressure in other dif districts, we have an obligation to be on message and to make health care a top issue in our community. And to also, not only in our general, but how it affects Latinos specifically, and eliminating those disparities. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do, because 
people don't, you know, when you're looking at the macro level and the suburb, you know, and, and health care policy on a major level, um, you know, the access to health care and insurance, um, you know, when you're dealing on a smaller level, you don't really realize, um, you know, the, how you can affect that policy. Mm. And I think it's our, what we're trying to do is create an institution where, where a resource for community organizers, a resource for community activists to have that information specifically when it, when it's, um, when it's, uh, it relates to health. But we have to realize that you know, denying access to health for our communities is just another way that they're trying to marginalize us and prevent us from having the political power that our numbers say that we should have. Great. Great. Can I? Yeah, briefly, and then <laughs> yes. we'll take a question. There's a um, I, I just want to say that, to be specific to New Jersey, we have a governor who's leading the charge on an attack against working people and poor people in general, and Latino working and poor people in particularly. Um, we knew it right away when, as soon as he became governor, um, he basically hung the uh, new, newly formed commission for new Americans uh, out to dry. Member. Member, you know, and you would know that uh, you know, this governor has not provided any support. Um, you know, the only thing he hasn't done is completely dissolve it, uh, but has basically ignored it um, and trying to let it die. Um, you know, but beyond that, you know, uh, kicking thousands of Latino, uh, uh, Latinos off of family care was an assault. Um, the changes that uh, he's trying to make to how school aid is distributed um, you know, getting away from looking at who qualifies for federal free and reduced lunch, and also getting away from in English limited uh, language uh, learners. So, you know, so, so basically, and that piece right there, he's saying if you're poor and you're Latino, you know, we're not going to provide you the resources you need to succeed. Okay, and these are not, you know, uh, this isn't a broad thing. This is an administration that is hell bent on on coming after our community. And part of the thing that we're doing at the Latino Action Network is that every time it happens, we're doing our best to let the community know about it and helping them fight back. And so that is, you know, the, that's, the, that's the politics on the ground. That's the work that needs to be done. Um, and, and if the governor, and this is not about being partisan, because if the governor wants to do something positive, come see us, we'll work with you and we'll help get the word out about it. But so far, he hasn't given us an opportunity. In fact, he's given us a lot of opportunities to get the word out about how we can you know, speak up for ourselves and fight back against this assault. Thanks. OK, Lucia, and then we'll I, go I to just want to say one last thing. I mean, you know, and just going on the in-state tuition piece, again, you know, Dems controlling the Senate, Dems controlling the Assembly. I'm a hardcore Dem, and I'm saddened by the reality that we can't get it passed, even to sit and let the governor say no. Let him, let him not sign it. Let him veto it. But I want to see it there. And the reality is that unless we push, and unless we're able to get our, I don't know if I can say progressive Democrats to really get this um, you know, push and get their colleagues push. Well, you know, reality is that we have to reach across, um, you know, uh, documentation status, authorization status. We have to push across to those elected officials that are representing all our communities throughout. We're spread out. And even though we're not maximum in numbers within any one uh, given district, the reality is that I notice this very clearly. In districts that are suburban, that are not majority Latino, um, we have a lot to contribute to the democratic ability to elect and the democratic votes. Because the majority of our areas, and even take Gloucester County, for example, yeah. and as well as the African American community, in the general election, when the Dems have a, um, a type of very small margin of competitiveness and that they have to take it over the hump, who are the voters? I mean, in parts of, the, of, of southern Jersey, the voters that are going after are black and Latino voters that are new in those districts that they want to be able to get to the polls because the majority of the white individuals that live in those areas are Republican. So we know that there is a trick to the game, and we haven't quite figured it out to ensure that the party, whoever's in control of the state senate and the state le uh, assembly, get them to contribute because at the end of the day we do have something to say at the in the electoral level and we haven't quite understood the numbers game because at the end of the day when you have to when it's a general when it's a democrat versus a republican 
black and Latino voters are gonna get Democrats over the hump in major competitive districts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna give it to Bill in one second, but I wanna interject that. I mean, insofar as a one big organizing victory is made up of s individual smaller organizing victories, Quite importantly, Rutgers University was not on record in support of in-state tuition when it came before the state legislature in January of 2010. And that silence was deafening to legislators and others. So yeah. there, there are challenges all the way up the ladder. And one thing I just want to echo what Lucia said is, on a national level, we couldn't get the DREAM Act passed when we had control of both the House and the Senate and a Democratic president. We couldn't get in-state tuition passed when we had, in New Jersey, a Democratic governor and a Democratic assembly and a Democratic Senate. So, you know, Christian's point is very well taken. We have to um, really stand up to um, um, elected officials who to take direct action against our community. But also, more importantly, I think, we have to hold um, elected officials accountable for inaction. All right, when they do have the power and they do fail to act. And I think one of the reasons why we um, have this uh, a, a state like New Jersey, which you have 700,000 more Democrats than Republicans, you have a Republican governor, is because the Democrats were in power and they failed to act. All right, they, they had 700,000 more Democratic voters in New Jersey. All you need is one more to win an election. And they lost badly. And I think that as a community, um, and I, I, again, I agree with what Lucia says, um, you know, we are overwhelmingly um, um, situated in democratic areas where, you know, democratic party has the strength. But it doesn't result into Latino representation. I, I would love to see um, our new assemblywoman have many more colleagues of Latino descent background in the legislature. We are not fairly represented no, in any in any it's way you, in any way you cut it. The and I think a big part of that is our participation at voting on a local, state, and national level. We're leaving a lot of political capital on the table. I love the way Robert phrases that. But we also have to be very vigilant when the people who we don't do support don't act in our behalf, and they're supposed to. They benefit from our support, but they don't act and repay us for what, for what support we've given. Thank you, Bill. Okay, I'm giving Chris, Christian 15 seconds, and then we have a question for the gentleman there, and then go to the microphone if you want to. I, yeah, I just, want to, I just want to say, you know, look, we know that, you know, our, you know, our work with, um, with, with our allies is not always perfect, and we definitely need to push back, and we are pushing back. Um, but we also need to also, you know, have a clear picture here, okay? We want more Latinos in the legislature, yes. but right now, every Latino that's in the legislature is on the D side, right? And, is, and the Republicans have yet to put up, don't have anybody who they'll run in a district where they can actually win. So, you know, let's, let's be clear about that. And I'm not saying that everything the Democrats do is great because we struggle within the party. I know that I've been part of many struggles and, you know, pushing back against Democrats I disagree with, you know, uh, uh, big time. So, but the, but the reality is that we're, we have an assault against us right now. And the tough part is that not only do we have it coming at us from the Republicans, but we have a handful of Democrats who have joined in to that assault. And trust me, they're hearing from us as well. Great. Okay, good. Let's go to the floor. We have two questions. Um, this panel is entitled Politics and Immigration. So my comment or my request for elaboration would be regarding secure communities. Secure communities became official in New Jersey on February 22nd, February 22nd of this year. And it sounds almost like no one knows about it. I speak to many law enforcement officials who didn't, doesn't even know what that is. Secure communities is a new rule in New Jersey and will be in effect in this entire country by 2013. Secure communities is also affecting not only the undocumented, which I just call it, but it also affects legal permanent residents. It has already been uh, activated in every courtroom in this state that a judge in his opening remarks saying, welcome to my court, will also say if you are undocumented or a legal permanent resident, that your information will be, and your, uh, your fingerprints are taken, it will be immediately referred to ICE. Um, 
I believe that um, people have a perception of those who are aware of this is that this is only going to affect fel felons and hardened criminals. This will affect everyone that is convicted of anything at any time in any courtroom. In New Jersey, we have seen the way 287G has been interpreted throughout the entire state, throughout different arenas in the state. So um, I was with uh, Yvette Clark, Congresswoman Yvette Clark last week, and she was basically saying, oh, it's just a rule. I'm on your side and things like that. But in New Jersey, this is a very lively state in many ways. So I'm going to ask the Latino panel Please elaborate as to your ideas and how we can get ahead of this. And I even said to the Congresswoman, this is an election year. Can we do anything with this in New Jersey? Can we make any things, anything improve with this situation? And she said, yes, there's always opportunities when there's an election, but I, I need my family here to tell me how to make this more publicly aware and how we can do something about it because we can do that. Lucy, are you going to respond? Just yeah, say briefly, so I was please with, say briefly what, what it is. Yeah, for, so, secure, so Secure Communities is an agreement between the federal government and the states where um, the FBI and the uh, police, upon um, arrest of, an, of a, an individual, will fingerprint, and these fingerprints will be matched with the database um, that would then be matched to figure out if whether or not you're undocumented, um, you know, whether or not you've convicted um, some type of crime under certain categories of, um, you know, of felonies and, and criminal convictions that, under the immigration laws, requires you to be, in fact, uh, deported. Uh, reality is that it's been implemented in a lot of horrific ways. Um, I know the state of New York, unfortunately, when I was there uh, working for the governor, um, Governor Patterson wasn't aware that his, um, you know, uh, head top person over in the Department of Corrections had signed um, the memorandum of agreement uh, with, um, with ICE at that time to require for the fingerprinting process to be able to take place. The idea was in the state of New York that every county would then have to individually sign on. So the state of New York signed on just to allow them to begin to have communications with the different counties in the state. Unfortunately, that wasn't what happened. There was a huge scandal in 2010 throughout, um, 2010, uh, I'm sorry, 2011, um, last year, regarding a national explosion regarding the, um, I would say illegal, but they were just jamming in secure communities at every state, saying that it would not be implemented without certain provisions, and then they lied, and then they would go around and, and do whatever it is that they wanted to implement. They said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll give you some money uh, to put together this equipment within all the prisons, and all this kind of stuff never happened, and the reality is that it was much, it was hitting many individuals, breaking up families, causing deportations when they were undue, and the reality is that being undocumented is not, is not a crime under criminal court, uh, under criminal law in the state, I mean in the country. So, you know, these kinds of offenses were not and should not have been required to have these kind of FBI checks, and, and the president specifically has over and over tried in the past year to change some of the dynamics within immigration to allow discretion on behalf of, of, of judges. And there has been some type of uh, memorandums and some additional laws that have changed. The reality is that in New York, Governor Cuomo, um, he rescinded on the memorandum of agreement because of a lot of pressure. I was there up until December 31st when Governor Patterson, uh, at that point, made some changes, supposedly, to the agreement. Um, Federal government um, has refused to back off of the um, agreement, saying that there's no need for an agreement. So who cares if the state of New Jersey signed on or, si or didn't sign on? They would still be required um, to do certain provisions of whatever that memorandum was. So let's just be, give credit where credit is due. Uh, Governor Chris Christie did not sign a memorandum of understanding with the federal government, as many governors did. Um, and, you know, he does, that's benign inaction, I would say, and, you know, he, right. that, that was, that was a, a good impulse. Everybody part. gets Unfortunately, in, the federal government decided that that wasn't, it was no longer necessary to have. That's right. So in February, New Jersey became active 
In other words, it, it's, it's, a, it's a process of the 50 states in order to go through a certain time frame, but it wasn't a signed memorandum of agreement the way other states signed on and New York rescinded, and as a re result of New York and Illinois rescinding and refusing to implement um, secure communities, the federal government says, you know what, who cares? We don't even need this. And as a result, all the states are now um, beginning the process. They're, they have changed the original intent of secure, I mean, they've changed some some of the parameters, Gov um, President uh, Obama came out last year in August with a different memorandum that in fact says that, and I think this is the part that most people don't know, right, which is the fact that we will not deport uh, families and break up families and will allow you to stay here for a specific amount of time. We will not deport dreamers or dream type eligible students um, that would fall under those provisions. Some have taken advantage of that. Um, you know, those kinds of provisions and have pushed that forward within immigration law. But let's be clear, there's one reality that's missing in the state of New Jersey. While we have a lot of advocacy groups doing immigration stuff, a lot of, you know, great advocacy groups doing things around Latino issues, um, we, again, we have to reach across race and ethnicity. This, this is a human rights issue, you know. This is an issue about unfair practices and unfair laws across the country. It's a civil rights issue, and I jam it away. Immigration is the new civil rights. You know, language access is a new civil rights issue. And the reality is that unless we start seeing it that way and start making allies with all, all of our um, elected and institutions, I'm very saddened to hear that Rutgers did not in action. I'm very saddened by that. And, may, and hold all these major institutions that we invest our money in. I mean, I went to Rutgers, freaking five years. I mean, like, screw that. I'm <laughs> double taking on my math. You know, like, at the end of the day, we have to hold all of our major, everyone that has, that's a stakeholder, held accountable because they act like allies and then they do nothing to push and ensure that our communities have access and that are respected and that, are, that we're seen as our human rights being protected. And until the federal government comes up with an adequate, comprehensive immigration reform versus putting up walls and putting up more money for enforcement, you know, Obama's touting one million, you know, 100,000 deportations in the past year. I mean, he's, he's going for gold, you know, and yeah. deportations are the key thing just to say that he's tough on undocumented. And tough. This, is, this really runs on a quota system. So the, the Department of Homeland Security's ICE division, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, is funded at, at a level of more than $2 billion. To, and th with that money, they are charged with creating, bringing about a certain number of deportations, which has uh, approached 400,000 per year in the last few years. But we need the faces, of those people that are being, families being broken up. I'm talking about sharing the story and getting it out there in the press that this is not about so-and-so who's undocumented, who shot so-and-so in the middle of a schoolyard, and that's the atmosphere that runs, that, that's a huge, image of what an, uh, you know, an immigrant is in this country. And that's not who we should be promoting. That's not who should we, talk, we should be talking about. Our communities are hardworking. Our communities are contributing. Sure, sure. They're paying taxes while Wells Fargo is opening more <laughs> and more banks in our neighborhoods. And they pay nothing, huge corporate tax holes and tax dodger like Wells Fargo. And they're holding major fundraisers with some key Latino organizations. It's killing me. Because at the end of the day, where are our principles? And as a community, it doesn't matter if you're Dem, doesn't matter if you're Republican. We have to understand what our issues are and reach across to different race and ethnicities to understand that this is about our communities and about our neighborhoods. And it cannot be about being undocumented or being permanent resident or being a voter or not. I can move as many votes if I'm undocumented as anybody who's an actual voter. You have one vote. I can move 50 in my block alone. That kind of attitude is what we need to get people to understand that they play different roles and every single one of them is as powerful as the next. We can't not hold on to just being voters and the electorate and the elected officials. Our communities have much more power than that. We just have to start actually building it at the grassroots and at the base. Forget about the grass tops. We have enough of those. We need to start building them at the base and start seeing those real faces. Great. That was great. great. Okay, we are way over time. We're going to take one more question from the floor and then we're going to wrap. I appreciate uh, the presentations and the panel, but regarding the politics, how do we hold our elected officials of color accountable? Because what is happening all over this country, 
We have African Americans and Hispanics who are selected by those individuals who are promulgating policies in our disinterest, and they are put in there with our votes, and they carry another agenda. For instance, a number of African American and Latino uh, Hispanic legislators in, Georgia, in Florida voted for Stand Your Ground, as they have for the Castle Amendment in many other states. Uh, President Obama has stood up uh, for some uh, Hispanic issues, but not all of them as aggressively. And we need to keep the pedal to the metal to make him do what he uh, needs to do, because had it not been for the Latino vote in my home state, North Carolina, he would have not won that state in the middle of the night in 2008 by 14,000 votes, where the overwhelming majority of Hispanic voters in North Carolina gave him his margin along with African Americans. The same occurred in Ohio, Virginia, which a Democrat hadn't carried in 40 plus years. You know. And so how do we hold our politicians of color accountable when they are put in office, in many instances, by individuals who are carrying an agenda that is anti-Hispanic and anti-black. Can I speak to that? Yeah. You do it by working at the grassroots again. You do it by our communities taking responsibility for developing the bench of people who are going to be running, and not just teaching them how to run and how to win elections, but also engaging them in policy issues, you know, uh, and, and, and developing, if, and if we're talking about a progressive agenda, right, it means engaging these folks when they're running for school board, when they're running for county committee, when they're running for anything, right, um, engaging them in, in discussions about policy. So that way when a vacancy comes up, right, we say, you know what, you know, we don't like the person you're picking, right? We, we have a whole bunch of people who are great and have worked their way up. Matter of fact, I'll tell you what, when there was a, a, a vacancy down in South Jersey, right, and, and, the, and the party was looking because of redistricting, there's an opportunity, it was great when everybody said, hey, you know what, there's a wonderful young lady there, uh, Gabriela Mosquera, who is progressive, she's great on the issues, and She's done her, you know, she's worked in staff in, in, in Trenton, so she knows policy and she knows how Trenton works. And that's who we all like to see, right? And people locally got behind her, right? Because we, we grew up one of our own, right? And we're happy that she's there now. And we congratulate her. She's at, here at the table with us. But we need more of that, right? Because if we don't do it, what's going to end up happening is the same, more of the same. That they're going to, you know, the party's going to handpick that person and just, we have to live with what we get, what we get. Okay, we're going to hear from Bill and Gabriela, and then we're done. Oh, sure. No, no, please. How do we get them accountable okay, okay. to vote on those issues Ladies that we've been raising? I mean, again, the same thing. Education is not, we're not talking about just Hispanic issues. You've said it, it is true. But how do we get them to actually do those issues? And again, we talk about New Jersey being very diverse within the Hispanic community. But yet, what I constantly see is that there is never an agreement of, a, of a, just one issue. Education, in-state tuition affects not only Dominicans, Colombians, but it okay. okay, so let me so just let me just quickly interject because I get what you're saying. So one, we don't want them to just vote on the issues. We no. want them to champion these issues, right? We want them to get at the forefront. And let me tell you something: they should not be there alone. And the reality is that unless their communities and their constituents, and one of, I've worked with elected officials, I would organize my community in order for them to organize me. And if we don't have a stronger constituency group that they can say, "Hey, I have to do this because they're going to eat me up alive." You know, I have to do this because if not, I'm out in terms of being not in favor with my electorate. 
being not in favor with my community because it's not just the electorate, but it's the fervor and the kind of ambience that you're setting me up in my neighborhoods, and I have to push back somehow. Reality is that we don't have that kind of, I mean, our elected officials, and, and you know, with all due respect, you know, to all of them that, and, and Gabriela's at the table, they need our voices to push them so that they have something to say, so that they have backup, because some lone soldiers out there will be lone and they will never be elected again because the party will choose to back somebody else. Again, but again, what I'm trying, to, again, following up with this is that we do, we, I hear a lot about uh, grassroots efforts, um, organizations, Hispanic groups, and there are lots of them within New Jersey. And again, every, <sighs> and the point, uh, what I'm trying to do is how do we make these let's say in Hispanic issues or Hispanic organizations, how do we get them to come together to agree in one issue? And we can do this one, I mean, I always think one at a time, Dominicans, Colombians, different, for this one particular, and then we can back up, let's say, Gabriela, who is going to represent on this issue. How can we get these groups to come in and say, you know, Gabriela, you have to come and do this, and you have to push all the other... What well, part of the state are you from? Just What part of the state are you from? I'm Essex County, I'm Montclair. Es no, no, see, Montclair? We need to hear yeah. from okay. Gabriela. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, as an elected official, I have to say, you have to come talk to me. I think Lucia mentioned it, right? You have to just keep on talking to an elected official. Uh, I was a staffer, so I, I understand. You just, it's, it's about communication. You have to keep the lines of communications open. You have to be just, I, I'm sorry. And numbers. Be, no, isn't it about numbers? About, I mean, yeah, it is about numbers, and, and you have to be persistent. It's about being <laughs> persistent. It's, you have to keep talking to me. I mean, so what I expect is, I do expect that after all this, I do expect phone calls from you guys. If you don't call me, how am I supposed to know? Lucia hit it in the head. You have to keep talking. You have to keep saying it over and over and over and over and over and over again. This is what is important to me. This is what is important as a Latina, as a Latino community. This is what we have to do. If you just keep saying and talking and then leave here and don't do anything about it, how are things are gonna change? Things are not going to change if we just talk about it. We have to do. So I challenge you, all of you, to keep talking <laughs> to, to, to me. Push. Uh, I, I challenge all of you to schedule meetings with our legislators here. I challenge you to, to schedule meetings with me. I, I mean, in the State House. You know how to reach me. I'm in the State House. If not, you know, I, uh, I, could, I could give you my business card. Uh, I'm, I'm on the web. I mean, I'm How's that for accountability and democracy yeah. in action? Yeah, We're going to have to pull it to an end there. There's another important panel coming up. This was fantastic. I want to thank all of you very much. Appreciate it.